click back. Do not reload. We have reconnected to Dimension 404. Hello and welcome to a bonus episode of Anthology presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. If this is your first time listening, Anthology is one man's exploration of the Twilight Zone as a first time viewer, wherein I review one episode, each podcast I review one episode of uh, Rod Serling's iconic series and pair it with a bonus review of a movie or show related to that week's episode. But with Dimension 404 premiering on Hulu back on April 4th, I'm actually covering each episode of Rocket Jump's anthology sci-fi series in this bonus episode series. You can find more of Anthology at anthologypod.com. And if you want to contact me, you can use the Facebook page at facebook.com slash anthologypod, tweet me at obsessiveviewer, or send an email to matt at obsessiveviewer.com. And uh, today I'll be discussing Cinethrax, which is the second episode of Dimension 404's first season that premiered on uh, April 4th, 2017 on Hulu. And uh, I'm going to get into kind of a spoiler review. So if you haven't seen Cinethrax yet, go check it out on Hulu and then come back and, and listen to my review of it. But I'll start off this review by just reading a brief plot summary courtesy of IMDb. A snooty cinema purist struggles to convince his fellow filmgoers that the 3D movie they're watching is summoning forth a brain-sucking interdimensional monster only he can see. Uh, starring in this episode is Patton Oswalt as Uncle Dusty and Sarah Hyland as Chloe. And writers for this episode were Des Dolly, Will Campos, and Daniel Johnson with directing uh, with Des Dolly directing um, <laughs> directing this episode. Um, so I'll kind of jump into my review here. I'll kind of give my initial thoughts. What I do with these episodes, with these Dimension 404 reviews, is I'll watch the episode one time through and then kind of jot down my initial thoughts on the episode. And then I'll watch it a second time uh, and take take notes while I'm watching it that second time. So that's kind of the the process I go into with these reviews. And my initial thoughts on that first viewing was just, eh. I, I thought it was just okay. Um, I liked the way that the episode portrayed the generational divide, and I liked how the millennials didn't seem too over the top. Um, and I also respected the uncle and niece relationship between Patton Oswalt's character and and uh, Sarah Hyland. But by the end of it, I just wasn't that invested in it. Um, the turn with the theater staff being... Uh, monsters or taken over by monsters um, just really wasn't effective for me. Um, and I, that's just kind of how I left that first viewing is just kind of not necessarily dissatisfied or disappointed, just kind of just unaffected by by the episode. Um, and then before I get into my actual review of the episode, Pat Oswalt's shirt is from the movie They Live, which it's kind of funny because I haven't actually seen They Live. Um, but it's got some similarities to this episode. Um, but some coworkers of mine <laughs> told me to watch They Live like a year ago, and I always get crap for it because I haven't watched it yet. But I'll probably I'll probably watch it now. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, that won't be a hostile work environment or anything. So yeah, so if you listen to my uh, first bonus review uh, for. Uh, matchmaker uh, a little while ago i was i was kind of i was kind of digging it i was kind of digging dimension 404 I, I was kind of eager to jump into it so kind of going from that to cinethrax and kind of not really feeling the episode kind of was a little bit of a bummer um also one of the first things i noticed or didn't notice was that the breaking up of the screen that was so prominently featured in matchmaker um like before each act break there was like a little uh buffering thing um or the frame rate dropped a little bit on on purpose um i kind of thought that that would be a running thing through all the episodes but i guess not because it wasn't in this episode at all but I mean, I guess that's okay because it would have been probably a little distracting or a little too much. Um, I do like that they seem to be doing this whole thing where they introduce it, it kind of seems like it's their version of Serling doing the opening the opening narration um, whereas instead of having you know someone come in and just be on screen and talk about the episode, uh, we see a digital we see some in some way 
in the scene, the numbers 404 pop up when Mark Hamill discuss or talks about how basically doing the opening narration. I think that's, I think that's cool. That's, that's a nice little, uh, a nice little thing to do. Um, or a nice little piece of, I guess, originality. I, I mean, I hesitate to say originality cause it is steeped in, you know, obviously it's kind of plays off of past anthology shows, but it's a nice way to introduce us to the story and the setting each episode. So I like, I like that. Um, so we're introduced to Dusty, who is the kind of he's kind of a down on his luck guy. He uh there's dialogue that implies that he's lost his job or he's currently looking for a job. And uh it seems like his movie night with his niece Chloe, played by Sarah Highland, is kind of the high point of his day, week, and maybe life at this point. Um and there's something to be said about dusty kind of living in the past as well like he it's clearly established that he is this gen xer who is uh really not with he's not like hip and with it like with youth culture he's kind of uh he's he's just kind of living in the past like he rattles off a bunch of different examples of uh older movies that are playing in theaters around the city um, but, uh, Chloe chooses to go see some young adult dystopian movie that's playing in Cinethrax. Um, and I, like, I don't know. I, I like the, I like the concept of Dusty living in the past and being kind of just this guy who isn't, you know, in touch with what's current and the current trends. He's comfortable in his own, in his own, uh, his own demographic of, of, of trends and everything in, in media and pop culture. He's comfortable in that arena, um, which I can respect that. I, I definitely can. Cause who wants to pay 50 some odd dollars for two movie tickets in a format with what, uh, what amounts to be a half of, or a third of a whole story. I'll get into that in a little bit, but, um, I do want to mention that him naming off like, oh, Reanimator is playing here, and and uh, oh, I can't remember the other movie he said. Um, oh, Suspiria is playing at, at the Independent. Um, I do like that because that's one of my favorite things to do is going uh, is go and see like a special screening of an older movie here in a couple weeks. Yeah, here in a couple weeks. Yeah, that is a couple weeks. Um, they're showing uh, Back to the Future in thirty five millimeter down at a. Um, it's called the uh, the Art Craft Theater in Franklin, Indiana, and I'm gonna maybe try to go see that. Um, just because I in the Art Craft Theater, if you're in Indianapolis or in the Indiana Indianapolis area or near Franklin, Indiana, that's like it's such a great like like movie palace place. Like it's very it's very very nice. They do uh, sc- screenings every week um, of older movies, and they it's it's really fantastic. Anyway, um, so they go to see Chosen, the final saga, part one, and uh, we see this huge banner in front of the multiplex that's just the most, um, the most, like, quintessentially young adult dystopian uh, movie poster that you can have. And it's kind of sad. It's kind of sad how the movie title chosen the final saga part one, it's sad how easy that title could be a real movie. Um, and I kind of, I kind of liked the, uh, like if you, if you look at the poster and on the screen when they're watching the movie, there's like two colons, um, in between saga and part one. I just thought that that was kind of a nice touch to kind of, kind of, uh, show how ridiculous, uh, you know, modern, uh, movies like that are not, not necessarily modern movies like that, but the business side of it to split, split a story up into two or three, uh, movies. And, and it's just, it's a nice kind of dig at the modern, uh, uh, movie industry. Um, and then they also introduced that Cinethrax is this special, this brand new, um, special format for viewing the movie and uh it kind of i mean this this kind of this kind of it, it kind of gets me um or it doesn't get me it's like i 
I really latched onto that because there are so many different formats of movies. There are so many different types of movies, types of experience, IMAX, 3D, 3D, um, uh, GDX, I think is, was one of them. Um, Dolby Atmos and it's so many different types of theater going experiences. And I, for one, it's well documented in the obsessive viewer podcast that I just, I, I really don't like 3d movies unless there's like a very special reason for it. Um, like if it was filmed specifically for 3d, um, I think probably the only movie that I saw in 3d that was really worth it was avatar. And I didn't even like the movie that much. And whenever the sequels come out, I'll probably see it in 3d just because I know that that's the type of thing that it pushes the envelope of technology and everything. All of these movies that are post converted into 3d after being shot in 2d, it's adds three, uh, it's darkens the film 30% because it has to adjust to 3d and, and, uh, it's, uh, it's such a headache and I, can't stand it. Um, and like, it's not, it's not filmed with 3d in mind. So when things are buzzing, pa- anyway, anyway, um, so I didn't mean to go on a rant there, but, uh, Dusty and Chloe get to the theater and they pay 50 some dollars for two tickets. And then Dusty has this, uh, the, the special glasses that I thought were kind of, I don't know. It was kind of, it was, it's a kind of a clever, um, set up for the episode that he has these special glasses that basically reconverts the movie into 2d when you see, see it in the theater. And it's what's used to kind of suss out this, uh, tentacle demon thing. Um, and I thought that was kind of cool. I, I thought that, that was kind of an inventive way to, uh, to kind of bridge that, uh, or bring, bring out that side of the story. Um, having dusty, be the only one that can see the monster and everything. Um, and it's, I have to admit, like it's, it's kind of a bummer when Dusty comes up to the, to the seat and sees that Chloe has, uh, well, Chloe's talking to the guy. And then, uh, when they sit down, Chloe's friends show up and it's just like, it's, it's a bummer to see that because it's clear like Dusty is, you know, this is the high point. As I said, it's a high point of his week and he really wants to spend time with his niece, but she has her friends there. And it's, I just kind of, I kind of cringed for him because that's such an awkward situation. That's such an uncomfortable situation. And it's really a bummer. Um, and then we get the, uh, like Chloe suggesting that Dusty sit by himself. Um, which Okay, another small tangent, and I promise this will probably be the last one. No, it won't, because I have another one coming up. But um, Dusty has reservations about sitting alone. And I really don't get the stigma about going to the movies alone. I mean, I I do it, like, all the time. And it's it's kind of nice. It's It's a nice, peaceful kind of thing to do on your own. I don't get the stigma about going to see a movie by yourself. I love doing it. And, like, I have friends that I go see movies with all the time. But I actually just saw Alien Covenant uh, by myself. And it was the first time I'd seen a movie by myself in probably a few months. Um, and it was just, it was really cool. Like the movie was okay, but uh, just, I really like seeing movies by myself. I don't know. Maybe I'm weird, but um, we get our first act break when the movie starts and we get this big whole to do about Cinethrax. And it's this whole, um, basically it's the, uh, it's the Dimension 404 equivalent of the IMAX um, introductory kind of movie theater experience thing where it's, they do all of the big 3d things and the sound effects and everything to really get you pumped up for it. Um, and it's, (laughs) it's followed up by dusty just saying, this is going to suck as he puts on his, uh, his special glasses. It's just, it's funny. And that's a nice, like kind of act break, um, for the, for the episode to get, bring us into our first, uh, set of ads for the Hulu episode. Um, and as much as, as much as I dislike 3d and as much as I don't bother going to 3d movies at all, that whole Cinethrax opening segment looked just really cool and kind of made me want to, I don't know, maybe if, maybe if a movie comes out that I, I would love to see, um, in 3d, maybe I'd, maybe I'd go check it out. Um, 
So when we come back, there's a scene where like they're watching the movie and Dusty is sitting behind Chloe and her friends and her friend starts texting. And this, this scene really hits home for me <laughs> because I can't, I, I don't understand how people, how any person can think it's appropriate to text in a theater. And I see a lot of movies and a lot of people text in theaters and I don't understand why people do that at all. Like I really don't. Um, it's just, it's so, I don't know. I, it just, it gets so under my skin and I can totally relate to Dusty in this scene when he's telling them to, you know, not text. And, uh, I love the kind of reversal of that a little bit later when he, when the monster attacks Dusty or when Dusty sees the monster and he's trying to get Chloe's attention, there's that reversal where her friend is like, so he can, so she can't text, but you can talk during the movie. Um, I thought that was, that was a really well-played, um, bit of dialogue there. And as for the movie, they're actually watching chosen the final saga part one. Um, the bits we, the bits and pieces we get to see of it. Um, you know, it's actually a decent parody of the whole modern, uh, trend of young adult dystopian movies um and everything i I thought it was it was kind of decent like there's the (laughs) like they kind of you know they spent some money to make this little movie parody um i'm thinking of the scene where the girl lifts up her shirt and she has that glowing tattoo on the back on her back it's like they actually kind of put some effort into and i i appreciated that and think that it really uh really hit home the kind of parody of it the parody aspect of it (laughs) And so we get, when we're watching the movie, Dusty sees this uh, tentacle creature come out of the screen. And I like the way that it's developed. I like the way that it's set up because first he sees something just kind of trying to break out of the screen. And like, we don't know what it is. He doesn't know what it is and all that. Um, And then when it actually comes out of the screen and we see that it's this creepy tentacle creature, um, it's effective. It's effectively creepy. Um, it's and it's pretty well done. It's a, it's a, the effects are just a little bit. I wouldn't go so far as to say they're a little cheesy, but they're just they're a little. Uh, I don't know. It's it's not meant to be like a super realistic thing, but uh, it's kind of it's kind of a little bit low budget, but in a good way. It's it's it fits the tone of Dimension Four Hundred Four pretty well. And when the monster actually attacks Dusty's face after he's dropped the glasses and he's picks them back up and everything like that's a really effective jump scare. I really, I really like that sequence of events and how Patton Oswalt's character just freaks out. And, uh, Patton Oswalt, he, like he plays panicked really, really well. Like he's really fantastic in this episode. And overall he really elevates the episode for me. Um, and it's just, it's really great. And then we get this, um, seen in the lobby when he is kind of taken out of the theater. Um, and it's just, it's kind of heartbreaking because he is talking to Chloe and he's trying to tell her that there's a monster in there. No one, no one is, uh, no one's, no one's believing him and everything. And then he asks her, um, did I embarrass you in front of your little friends? And in that moment, it's, it's kind of a complicated situation. Maybe I'm kind of reading more into it or, or, uh, Maybe I'm looking more into the situation as than what than what is actually on the screen. But I just kept thinking back to how Dusty was kind of um, his his movie night with his niece was sabotaged by his niece's friends. And honestly, Dusty has a right to be mad at her since she brought her friends into their arranged movie night. Like they, it's I don't know. It's it's. Like I would be pissed if I was Dusty and it's really kind of sad to have Chloe not only tell him that he's embarrassing her, but also for her to choose to be with her friends. And also it's really, it's really, uh, really sad that she just tells him that he does, that she doesn't want to be like him. And in that moment, it's like, we already know that Dusty has no job. Uh, he doesn't have a lot going on in his life and, because of that, Chloe's kind of total rejection of him just really kind of stings. I thought it was really, really, uh, really good. Um, at that point, at that point, we're like halfway through the episode and it's, uh, it's kind of funny because when he gets taken into the, uh, projection booth, um, the millennial employees of the movie theater, they're kind of out snobbing him by talking about the, uh, the silent film with the, with the train and everything. Um, I thought, I thought that was a nice touch because it's, 
like when you're in your early twenties, late teens, early twenties, and you like movies, you can be really snobby. Um, so I like that they kind of had that. Uh, they included that element into this into the script. And then from here, this is where <clears throat> I don't know. This is where I kind of lose a little bit of interest or where the, I don't know if lose interest is the right word quite yet, but it's like the escalation of the story, like the story escalates really fast. So we see that the uh, employees of the movie theater are all possessed and controlled by this demon, whatever. Um, and, and that alone, that's pretty solid at first. Show, like their reveal is is pretty solid at first. And then... I don't know. They kind of fight with Patton Oswalt a little bit. And then he takes out a burrito and that saves him from getting his head impaled by, uh, that thing on the wall. I, I don't know. I, that, I don't know. I I thought that was just a little bit silly. And then we get a long stretch where it's just basically a game of cat and mouse between the, uh, possessed movie theater employees and dusty. And then, uh, Chloe finding out, what have like finding out the truth and then escaping the theater it's i don't know and there's not really much you, else you could really do to really bring me back into it but i just was kind of bored by it um however when dusty is in the janitor's closet and he's texting chloe like those text messages are really sweet like it was kind of heartbreaking to see him uh text her and say that uh she's his only friend and uh he doesn't want her to be anyone she doesn't want to be and, and all that. I thought that was, that was a really nice tender moment in the episode and they, they really did it uh, right in that. But when the theater itself actually turns, when, when Chloe realizes what's going on and, and the theater turns against her and, and goes after her, I kind of lost interest in it at that point. And I don't really know why. And my, my working theory is that it may be, it may be because at that point we really have no idea what's going on or why it's happening. Like we know that there's this weird tentacled creature and that they're possessing, uh, the moviegoers and everything, but we don't really know why we don't know what's like, what to what end it is. And we don't know that until, uh, Chloe gets into the projection booth and the enslaved, uh, workers say that, uh, Sinithrax came to unite us and came to make us one. And like, it's a decent hook, but it comes like, I don't know. It comes like three quarters of the way through the, through the episode. And I don't know. I just, it just didn't really sit, sit right with me. Um, and then we kind of get into the ending of the episode where Chloe and Dusty escape, um, after this really cool scene where Dusty, uh, smashes the ax in the head of the, the dude that, uh, Chloe was, was liking, um, to save her. It's like, that was a really cool, uh, really cool shot and really cool scene. But after that, like, I don't know the whole idea of Chloe being transformed and dusty losing his connection with his niece. It's just a, it's, it's a downer. And then to kind of add insult to injury, he tries to leave the theater and then he sees that the world has been taking over and overall it's just really bleak. And then we get the moment where Chloe tells him that, uh, he should stay with her. And she says, stay with me and you'll never be lonely again. Stay and watch the movie. And like that, that dialogue, that's kind of haunting. I I was kind of really liking that. And it was really uh, creepy and effective, but overall the kind of bleak ending where they're just in the theater and he puts on the glasses and then the credits or the, the movie starts and then the credits start rolling, uh, for us watching it. It's, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It, it's a really bleak ending, which I don't mind bleak endings, like reference my, all of my reviews of black mirror. And so I don't really mind bleak endings, but I don't feel like there was any real payoff in Cinethrax for the bleak ending. Like, I don't feel like the bleak ending really paid off anything that was set up in the first, uh, 30, 35, 40 minutes. Um, the whole episode is about Dusty trying to save Chloe and it all kind of just goes to hell at the end. And it's all very sudden. Um, and Dusty just kind of gives up because of his love for Chloe, which that's admirable. And it's fairly effective as, as a, uh, as an ending to their story, I guess, but it just feels really sudden and really quick. And it didn't really satisfy me in, in any real meaningful way. 
Um, and I, I don't know. I think I can make peace with that ending. I really can. But overall, I just, I just thought the episode was just okay. Um, which is kind of a bummer because I was really eager to see this, this episode. Not that I knew much of anything about it, just that I knew that it was about a movie, uh, a moviegoer and, um, it had Patton Oswalt. So those, those two things were kind of right up my alley. So it's kind of a bummer to be kind of a little underwhelmed by it, but overall I thought it was, it had some, it had some decent moments and some good, um, some good, uh, moments here and there between Patton Oswalt and Sarah Highland. And I guess my overall thoughts would be that I, uh, let's see. I, so, okay. So I really enjoyed the kind of generation gap between Dusty and the millennials. And I really dug Patton Oswalt's performance. I thought he was really fantastic. And, uh, the way that the episode used flashy new movie formats as a vessel to take control of moviegoers and the human race, that's, that's a pretty fun concept. And it's a nice critique of how the art of moviegoing is struggling with the business side of cinema. Um, so I, I respected the commentary that the episode is spouting and everything. And for me as a viewer, the dusty is my conduit to the story and who isn't annoyed by the things that he's annoyed by? <laughs> like it's a very relatable thing. And on the flip side, I can, I can see teenagers watching this episode and identifying with Chloe and the embarrassment that she feels with dusty around, uh, that, uh, the embarrassment that dusty causes her. So I feel like they, they hammer down the actual, um, motivations or, or the character dynamics pretty well. Um, and those things really worked for me in this episode. However, I just, again, I just feel like the ending didn't come off or didn't come with much of a payoff. And, uh, the way that Dusty gives in so that he can be with his niece, it's something I can respect, but the escalation of the monster just comes so quick that before you know it, Sinithrax has taken over the world and it's just a little too much for me. And it's, uh, it happens a little too fast. Um, and honestly, I would have preferred a less bleak and less rush at, rushed ending. Um, so overall, Sinithrax was just okay. Um, I didn't have a problem watching it. Wouldn't mind seeing it again at some point. I just wasn't quite as invested with the monster story as I would have liked to be. And uh, Patton Oswalt and Sarah Hyland were great in the episode, though. So um, even though it wasn't really to my liking that much, um, I can still respect it as as an episode of, of Dimension 404. Okay, and that'll do it for my bonus review of Dimension 404's Cinethrax. Um, once again, I just want to remind you, you can check out all of my past episodes um, at anthologypod.com. I've reviewed all of season one of The Twilight Zone, and I'm working on season two. I also did bonus reviews of every episode of Black Mirror. And uh, obviously right now I'm working on my bonus review series of Dimension 404. Uh, coming later this year, I'm planning a bonus episode review series on the new ep- the new season of Black Mirror whenever it comes out, hopefully later this year. And also uh, uh, Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams, um, which should be coming out on Amazon Prime probably here in... I mean, I would assume it's late, late this year, maybe after Black Mirror. I'm not sure, but, um, we'll see. You can check all that out at anthologypod.com and make sure you like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. Uh, next time on this bonus episode series, uh, for Dimension 404, I'm going to be reviewing Kronos, which I know nothing about. Um, so I'm looking forward to to going more in depth with Dimension 404. And uh, before I go, I just want to say, I hope you guys enjoyed my review. And if you have any thoughts, feel free to contact me with them and uh, and let me know what you thought of Synthrax and Dimension 404 and the Twilight Zone and anything I talk about here on this podcast. Um, so yeah, on that note, thank you guys so much for listening and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Anthology, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. For more of Anthology and a full archive of my episodes, go to AnthologyPod.com. And if you want to help support the show, the easiest way you can do that is by leaving a rating and a review on iTunes. You can also make donations to the show courtesy of the donate link in the show notes of each episode and on AnthologyPod.com. For recurring donations, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer and just choose one of the anthology reward tiers. 
If you enjoy Anthology, feel free to check out The Obsessive Viewer, a weekly movie and TV podcast I host with my friend Tiny and occasional guest co-hosts over at ObsessiveViewer.com. You can also join The Obsessive Viewer Facebook group at Facebook.com slash The Obsessive Viewer. For book reviews and commentary on the world of reading, check out our sister site at obsessivebooknerd.com. And for philosophical discussions from a secular viewpoint, check out my friends Chad and Amanda at thesecularperspective.com. Finally, if you'd like to contact me with your thoughts on the show, my reviews, my bonus reviews, or for any other reason, you can tweet me at obsessiveviewer, send me an email at matt at obsessiveviewer.com, or send me a message on Facebook and like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash anthologypod. Once again, thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.